All right. Welcome, everybody. Just uh, give us a few minutes to uh, wait for everybody to filter into the room here, and we will get started in just a little bit. some co-hosts and speakers to the room here. Now, Christoph, I am trying to invite you to co-host, but if you are not in a good position to do that, then Pavlinex and I can take care of that. There you are, you're a speaker now. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Was that your music playing in the background? Yes, that was my music. It was an intentional design decision. Nice. Nice chill out music. Yeah, it was chill out music. It was a uh, lo-fi chill beats, chill study girl, you know, the famous YouTube channel. Is that how you call soft board music now? M maybe. I don't keep up with all these musical terms. I don't know. The chill wave. Okay, so it's a, it's like a modern, it's like a, a better version of elevator music, really. The next generation of people will probably be very tired of it and reject it. But I like um, I like the music, Stephen. Uh, nice touch. <laughs> um, but why don't we why don't we kick things off? We're we're a few minutes here into it. People are still uh, hopping in. And um, we have two topics. Uh, so first of all, welcome everyone to the Bitcoin Design Community call. This is actually number 29, I think. Uh, it says 30 up there, but I think it's 29. Not that it really matters. Uh, but uh, we had, there were two topics suggested uh, by me actually for the call today. One of them was discussing the, the user experience of the Bitcoin Design Guide, sharing anecdotes, discussing what's good, what's bad how we use it, how we don't use it, how we want to use it. And the second one was catching up with the Shock the Web Hackathon, which started yesterday. And there have been some really good talks and teams are forming, trying to figure out what lightning apps uh, to build. Um, but uh, if we have a moment now, we could also, uh, anyone feel free to suggest other topics that we can discuss as this is meant to be a community call. So uh, it's an it's a bit of an open forum, so anyone can raise their hand, suggest a topic, anything you'd like to talk about. Please go ahead. Those sound like uh, very meaty topics in and of themselves, so I don't myself have anything to add. Yeah, can, anybody can also raise their hands uh, as we go along. Um, so I'll, I'll kick things off. Uh, which one? Okay. Um, oh, I think um, Millie and uh, somebody else, Millie and Michael, uh, are raising their hands. 
Oh, I don't see that. My, my, weird. My oh, they're good. They're as a host. Oh, I see. I'll try to add you as a, as a co-host. Yeah, so they are being promoted to speaker status. <clears throat> All right. Um, I mean, uh, I meant like to, to jump on the Bitcoin design guide subject. Um, the only thing, my experience like with the Bitcoin design guide that I had a little bit difficulty with is uh, when you guys announced that uh, Lightning content is added to it. I was sort of expecting like uh, a division in the guide in a sense, like Bitcoin related and lightning um, related content. I know like both of them are, are quite connected, uh, but I was going into, in that route uh, in my mind when I was looking for um, a lightning content, uh, especially for example, when I went like into onboarding um, and I just wanted to see like how the wallet we use, I wasn't sure, um, okay, this is a Lightning wallet, okay, this is more like a, a Bitcoin wallet and um, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I second Millie with that, with Patricia told me about the second version of the Bitcoin design guide that adds Lightning. Uh, in my mind, because we are get used to, to everything is so easy, <laughs> I was looking, where is the Lightning button almost? Um, yeah, maybe like uh, find like shortcuts in the design guide in the in the index maybe it could be yet useful uh, I don't know yeah I have the same feeling that Millie I just want to second that uh, I had one topic that we, we could potentially bring up uh, Stephen I know you've been uh, vocal on Twitter on the BIP21 kind of the the one QR code the mixed QR code of on chain and lightning um, if there's time to discuss that, uh, I, I think that's an important topic, and I'm happy to talk about it. We also have Brad, who's a designer with me at Cash App. So both of us have been thinking a lot about this, so we're happy to contribute our thoughts and or uh, research and findings to the community. So let us know if we can help there. Awesome. Yeah, maybe we should, uh, if we have some time after the um, after uh, talking about the uh, kind of guide feedback and the, the Bolt Fund thing, we could um, dedicate a couple minutes to the Bit21 thing. That'd be great. Um, yeah, I think uh, I hear what you're saying, uh, Millie and Dulce, about the the like lightning content. It was that was a, that was a, something we really struggled with. I think um, you know when we first like set out to. Uh, build all the lightning content for it. It was, it was kind of this big question at the beginning of like, should it be a separate thing or should it be all mixed in together? And it was like, I think, I think, I don't know, if, I'm not going to argue that what we did was perfect, but I would say that like, our, our, our thinking was that like, so would someone feel frustrated if they like read through this guide and like read all this stuff about like, oh, this is how you build Bitcoin applications. And then it was like, oh, now you have to read the lightning section. Um, you know, to, you know, you're, you're not fully up to speed. You now have to go through the lightning section. And so we started going down this path of like, well, what if it was all just integrated? You're learning it all at the same time. But um, yeah, having said that, it's like, it, it, it's, if I'm hearing what you're, if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, it's like, you know, sometimes you're, you know, if you're scanning it quick, quickly for information or searching for a specific topic, um, that kind of, that kind of topic is, isn't always easy to find. Um, so if you want something very, very specific about lightning, uh, you're, you're not entirely sure where to look for it. Am I, am I understanding that right? Yeah, exactly. This is what I meant. Yeah, let's, let's take a note on, on that and, and figure out how we can address that because that makes total sense. People learn, learn about Bitcoin, they learn about lightning and they expect that this is somehow treated separately and in 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 some ways it is i think we're the new structure that we're working on will be more product focused so there will be one section that is a basically a lightning first wallet and then we'll have another reference design that will be a multi-sig wallet which is right now by necessity uh, um, on the bitcoin network only um, but it's still an indirect separation of, of lightning maybe we can um, maybe there are some places we can address this yeah, and I think in the past we talk about creating personas. Like I think it, what is in my head is there is this persona, this developer that is building something very specifically for lining, 
uh, let's say John is looking for to build a lining app and in his app he has like a a, a lining app or app then he just want to look specifically for lining uh, it's, it's more like oh what is the pain point of John then and how we connect really really fast with him uh, how we how we help him to to solve his problem in a very smooth way is what is my mind uh, yeah but thank you <laughs> yeah it's a it's a valid point i think uh, daniel here speaking um, i'm looking back or thinking back about a year ago when we started uh, the work on the lightning kind of addition to the guide and we had a big discussion but where we ended up and i think personally is the right choice is that from a user perspective which the guide ultimately tries to take um, as a starting point from the user's perspective you know you should ideally not have to worry too much about the difference between on-chain and lightning um, and that's really kind of the perspective that the guide is written from. So, of course, if you were already familiar with the guide when it was only kind of talking about on-chain, then, yeah, it, it makes sense that you didn't notice that much different. And I think we could try and look into tackling that as a kind of a, as an add-on. Uh, I think that makes sense. But just to reiterate, you know, where we were coming from and, uh, you know, a year or two from now, I hope that maybe the distinction is uh, less than it is now. I mean, today we have a landscape where many apps are kind of either or, but I'm hoping that within a year or two, most apps are going to be both. So that's sort of, uh, I think, the rationale behind uh, um, the direction we took. Um, who are the the user that use mostly that guide? Is it like mostly designers? Is it mostly like um, normal people? Or is it mostly like developers? Oh, what kind of user you guys had in mind when building this guide? I mean, that's a very good question. I think the answer is we don't know <laughs> because we have, we have no sort of tracking or uh, analytics on the site whatsoever. My gut feeling would be at the moment it's probably leaning a bit towards, you know, fairly knowledgeable people that, you know, have been around the space for a while. But again, we wanted to write the guide in a way that it was accessible for someone who doesn't have that background. So if you're a designer um, coming in without any Bitcoin experience or if you're a developer uh, or anybody, but basically you're coming new to the subject, it should work for them. So maybe it's leaning a little bit more towards the kind of generalist than the specifics. It's like, you know, if you're a technical person, you might want, uh, or you might already know uh, a lot more technical details than is in the guide. But, um, you know, our kind of target audience was the general case where someone is coming in uh, more or less fresh. But uh, at the same time, we obviously hope to add depth over time. Christoph? Yeah, I would, I would just add that it's not a general mainstream audience user. It is definitely people who, who work on uh, Bitcoin applications, kind of the, the builder audience. Um, and I can, I can share a document with you. I tried to think through some of this over the last uh, few weeks. And so, so the, the, way, the way I personally look at it, I don't know if anybody shares that, is that there are designers new to Bitcoin they need certain information. There are um, Bitcoiners new to design. It could be uh, some a developer who works on application, could be a team, could be uh, that's trying to adopt a design process, um, but they want to understand how, to, how design works kind of in the first place, and then also how design works in Bitcoin. And then you have the person already working on a Bitcoin application, could be a designer or a developer. Ideally, they've already kind of worked through those first two um, you know, areas of content and of kind of in depth on it. And then they ha they might have different needs. So um, let's say um, a, a builder might be in product discovery. They're trying to figure out what project to build. And so they might uh, want to learn about, you know, personal finance in the real world or okay, in traditional world and how that translates to a Bitcoin world. 
uh, to figure out what product to build. They might want personas and research and other things. Uh, a person might be um, in working on a project that has no design process, just focus on the technical side, and they want to like, build a design system, adopt some design process. They might already, they might be working on a specific feature or a specific user flow. Uh, they might be integrating a new feature. And then, you know, as you go down, uh, goes go further down, the, what they need gets more specific. Um, and what they're looking for becomes more specific. And they also start using the site very differently. Uh, like a newcomer, they might, uh, you know, they might end up from a Google search and they just kind of snooping around or they might uh, take a linear path through it. And then as you go further down, maybe people look, you know, search for very specific topics in technical terms. So I can share that document with you if you're interested. And um, that's just kind of my, my logic or <laughs> how I rationalize these things. If that helps. Yeah, I'd be happy to see the document for sure. Yeah, any other feedback or thoughts in the guide? How you, how do you you like it? You hate it? It works for you? It doesn't work for you? Things you'd like to see in the future? Uh, Sanjay requested to speak, so maybe he has some feedback as well. I'm not sure. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on a point that Daniel made, and it's one that I've just been thinking about myself, which is how much should the user care about receiving on lightning versa versus on chain and in, do, do we think there's an eventual state i think daniel um offered his his opinion uh, but but for the rest of the group do we think there's a there's an eventual state where the user really ought not to care or or do we think that there will always be um some sort of fundamental difference between receiving on lightning from a user perspective, right? Whether you know, I, whether that's sort of a, a savings account versus a spending account. Uh, I'm thinking about wallets that do both, um, or or can it eventually be entirely abstracted away um, as 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 simply a technological implementation that the wallet will decide for you, and all you need to do is say, "I would like to receive Bitcoin." Yes, like absolutely. I think uh, that um, these, uh, uh, you know, as uh, Lightning and Bitcoin continue to um, develop and uh, we come up with better design patterns, um, I think that yes, uh, we'll get to a point where it, it's not the users not it's not really going to matter. Um, and uh, like, you know, it's I know it's, it, it sounds a little like. Uh, far in the future it's probably going to be many many years out um, this isn't the kind of thing that's going to happen overnight um, but uh, I think that as a the, you know economy of lightning service providers continues to grow and um, so we get more liquidity on the network there becomes more incentive uh, to be a lightning service provider uh, that that also creates the incentive to create the best user experience around getting somebody on to on board to lightning and getting liquidity so in my opinion, yes, we'll absolutely um, get to a point where, uh, you know, the, the user doesn't really have to care about um, which they're using and the wallet can kind of make the best decision for them and prompt them or not. Um, this, this could be a, a good segue into what uh, Michael brought up about, about the BIP21 QR code, but um, I wanted to give, a, you know, Daniel or anyone else a chance to chime, chime in on that before kind of segueing there. Thank you. Yeah, I guess we have kind of jumped into the second subject already, yeah, but that's that's fine. Let's go with the flow. And uh, just to clarify my, you know, opinion, I guess, was is it's not that it doesn't matter uh, ever, the difference between on-chain and Lightning. Of course, it does for um, specific applications. And, you know, if you if you are the more knowledgeable you are, the, you know the more it's going to matter to you, basically. But the point I was making is that we should try and avoid to specifically design applications that only work on one or the other. I would love for most uh, products to handle both, but then, you know, maybe in some cases you you are able to decide for yourself, right? You mentioned the savings account versus the 
cash account. Or, you know, there might also be some applications that are specific enough that they will, you know, more or less default to one or the other, depending on the use case, but they still support both. So, you know, uh, my basic opinion was just that at the moment we're in a land where we are very specific about the difference. Like people talk about Lightning a lot uh, instead of talking about Bitcoin. And I think... You know, the trajectory I'd like to see is where you talk more about Bitcoin than about, you know, Lightning, I guess. I would love to hear as well from, from Michael, you know, how, how does Cash App and, and, a, and a product that has so many users think about this? Maybe it's too early, maybe it's something you can't really divulge, but yeah, I'd love to hear if you have a point of view. Hey, if he doesn't, I have... Uh a question or a point to make if that's cool yeah so uh, also my name is michael i'm product on cash app uh, brad i know is listening he's really you know, uh, uh, brad brad Sure thing. Yep. Absolutely. Was, I, I think, two years ago in El Salvador, about 98% uh, of payments were on, on chain. And then this last year, I think it's flipped. And 98% of El Salvadorians are paying when they when they buy a gift card on BitRefill. They're paying with Lightning. So for my just uh, you, looking at that data and trend, it, it feels like in El Salvador, Bitcoin, well, Lightning is Bitcoin which I just think is an interesting train of thought, right? Um, I, I think we'll go over a certain divide where it'll, it'll just be Bitcoin and Lightning is Bitcoin. Uh, piggybacking on, on both what Daniel and Steven were saying is I, I, I personally do agree that it should just auto magically work and, 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 and the customer doesn't really need to choose. I think one caveat is there may be a certain dollar amount threshold, right? I literally just bought coffee for $5 on Lightning at a store this morning. Um, of course, I don't want to do that on chain. Uh, but maybe if I'm buying a house or a car and I'm getting a down payment on my house and I want to move to Bitcoin, maybe that should just automatically default to on chain, right? Uh, because it's more secure, it's easier to audit, etc. So I still think we're early and a lot will change over the next decade. But definitely team kind of one user experience team abstract uh, all of the complexity away and we can even go further and go do we need to brand lightning or even just totally hide lightning as like tcp ip of a web browser most customers have no idea what tcp ip is um, maybe we should do the same thing with lightning so that's kind of an open thought i have uh brad Any other? yeah i i um yeah, I, lo I love the discussion that's happening here. And um, Michael's probably sick of me already, you know, talking about jobs to be done for people as we've been working uh, together really closely um, uh, on Bitcoin. And and I think, like, ultimately, if we can, at, at the end of the day, it's sending and receiving Bitcoin and, and, it's, and it's people, you know, uh, trying to... to do that job and, and have that job be solved for them. And, and so I think, you know, we've had the discussion of like, ultimately how do people send and receive Bitcoin? Um, and there's a few different scenarios. It's either, you know, somebody's nearby. I'm standing right next to somebody. I either like somebody owes me Bitcoin or I want to send somebody Bitcoin. Um, I could be a merchant. I could be a creator. And in that case, it's, you know, you've got the QR code and, um, but then, you know, there's, uh, we're specifically cash app. It's like, okay, well, a lot of people are probably not nearby each other and, um, they might be sending from afar or receiving from afar. So, so how do we kind of prioritize based on these different use cases? And I think that's, that's really been the challenge when we, take a look at like existing Bitcoin wallets and these kind of legacy systems that um, have come about. And so how do we kind of almost try and break them to, to bring about something that ultimately 
is a great user experience for people. This, uh, this also makes me think of a, a topic Daniel talked about uh, a lot um, uh, around progressive security, uh, meaning that um, on you know, Lightning, you have a hot wallet that's always online. Um, but if you go over a certain amount, you might want to move it to cold storage, a multi-sig setup, or some, some other configuration uh, to reduce the risk. And the wallets can, applications can guide you to that when, you know, they feel like it's appropriate based on, you know, once you, if you just store, store 10 euros or $10 in a wallet, maybe not a big deal for you. Maybe it is based on where you live. If it goes up to a hundred thousand, 10,000, you know, the situation changes. And as a user, you also want to feel more secure about this. Maybe you want to do some type of budgeting or savings or so, and maybe you want to, you prefer switching applications. So on the one hand, there's kind of the technical reality of things, which will evolve over time. And then there's also a, just the user needs and the user comfort with this uh, with this whole setup. But the, t taking it back to where this started, the uh, the starting point for this were were BIP twenty one URLs, right? Something way more practical and and specific that we could uh, get back to. Stephen, uh, since yeah. you're you're the purveyor of that, or I don't know if that's the right word, maybe you can give an an overview in case anyone is not familiar with with that. Yeah, so um, uh, I'd say, um, yeah, purveyor, I, I'm not sure. I, uh, I It's not like I came, I think certainly did not come up with the idea. I learned it from Johns and Pavlinex and Steve Lee. I'm not sure where the idea originated from. I just built the, the website for it, basically. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the general idea is um, that uh, we could uh, use an existing standard uh, called BIP21. Um, and, uh, you know, it's got a kind of intimidating sounding name, but basically all BIP21 is, is it's this thing that lets you create something that looks similar to what you would think of as like a, web, a website address, a URL. Um, but instead of saying, you know, HTTP, whatever the website is, uh, it would say, you know, Bitcoin colon, and then you'd have like a, an address and some other kind of optional parameters that you could include there. And so the idea is that we can use this already existing format that's been around for almost a decade and add uh, lightning invoice data into that. Um, it creates something that looks kind of like a URL, but it tells, you know, it can tell a computer, this is how you pay uh, the person on chain, or this is how you pay the person via a lightning invoice. Um, and uh, not every, you know, lightning wallet supports that. Um, so we're trying to document which wallets do and don't support it. Um, and all that uh, with the hopes that uh, we could simplify the, the user experience um, just by uh, delivering a single QR code. And in terms of, you know, single QR codes, the, the, the main kind of thing that becomes problematic is that, um, you know, when you have an application that supports both on-chain and Lightning, um, it, uh, you know, typically you'll, you'll have this like little UI tab that's like, um, you know, if you want to make an on-chain address, you tap this UI tab. If you want to make a lightning invoice, you switch to this other tab. And, um, you know, the actual switching of tabs is fairly easy, but there's this whole education component, of like trying to teach somebody what the difference between the two tabs is. Um, and, you know, it's like, if you could just have it all boiled into to one QR code, then, you know, that, that would greatly simplify that. You don't even have to go through that whole educational component. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, but the problem is, is that no, no wallet at the moment can actually experiment with this. Like, you know, for, for example, th this could be wrong. We could be totally off base here. Maybe this isn't a good idea. I don't know. But uh, the problem is, is that nobody can actually experiment with using these QR codes because there's not support all across the board for scanning them. So kind of what we're trying to do with this website and this initiative is to 
uh, try and encourage wallets and uh, other projects to in encourage the like encourage them to be able to scan this type of QR code or to be able to read this type of format. Once we have support all across the board for people actually being able to read it, wallets can then make a decision about whether or not they want to actually start producing these QR codes as like their default way of receiving a payment. Well, thanks, Stephen. I think it's really awesome that you're doing this uh, or that we're trying to do this as a community because I think it's been one of the things that have been somewhat plaguing the Bitcoin product space is that there, there have been so many standards and so many products that have slightly different implementations or doesn't adapt uh, all of them. And if we as a community of designers can kind of get behind something and really try and promote it to most of the wallets or most of the products that that would be really valuable I think so thank you thank you for doing this yeah in my experience even switching tabs is a challenging part for the end user like in BTC pay server I constantly see people just asking how can I pay uh, this doesn't work, uh, whereas they just don't realize that they have to switch tabs. Just wanted to say that as well. It's not just uh, about that. So it's tricky. And if you guys saw recently somebody, I think b 3 Phil uses uh, this in a very interesting way. Uh, you try to pay an invoice and they first ask you which wallet are you using. And I really don't think this is the future that we want, like asking people what is your wallet and then afterwards adapting your uh, payment system to to <laughs> to a specific wallet like if you go to bitpay demo you will see that they have 70 wallets and then you choose which wallet you use and then according to that they provide you with an experience which is not the future i sign up for agreed I, you know this is this is something um we've been doing just like looking into as far as like user research and just kind of gathering a little bit of some some qualitative data from from people who are new to bitcoin and there's just mass mass confusion around like lightning and and just that terminology and you know a lot of people think oh you know lightning coin or litecoin and uh that's just a, a really big pain point that um you know, I'm looking forward to kind of that that term that Michael was using, automatically uh, helping people um, kind of do that decision making for them based on the scenario, based on kind of the wallet that they are transacting with. But again, yeah, just just uh, again heading home the point that this bifurcation is is not. Um, not a good experience from what we've been hearing from from people out out there in the world. Go, going back to um, what a, a few folks have said already, I I do tentatively agree. Um, I'm very new to this, so still kind of thinking out loud. But I do tentatively agree that the eventual end state is one where the user ought not to care between lightning and on chain and ought to simply think i would like to receive bitcoins i'm just wondering whether it it could be a mistake to try to get there too quickly i feel like right now users n know a little too much and, and could potentially be confused and a wallet that does both could potentially be confused if the wallet tried to abstract it away and the user sitting there going, wait a minute, is it going to be on chain or is it going to be lightning? Because there's different expectations, right? Um, given that lightning isn't yet where we want it to be. And so just, just wanted to throw out there that like, maybe, maybe it's too early to try to that, that said, I, I did read through, um, the, the, the very nicely written, um, proposal. And, um, I, I liked it. I, I was actually wondering like, what are the, what's what's the downside i mean if if a wallet it punts it seems like it the qr code that has the lightning parameter built in punts the decision as to how much to expose that in a wallet that does both it punts the decision on how much to expose that to the wallet designers right they can choose to have a tab 
they can choose to abstract away the technology entirely. Um, and so what, what, are the, what are the downsides of that proposal? Well, first off, I can go ahead and say that, like, uh, you know, in terms of, yeah, you're right, some, some users do kind of know too much, like, you know, people who follow Bitcoin very closely know the difference between Bitcoin and Lightning. And, and to that kind of user, it might be irritating if the wallet um, makes the decision. So I, I wouldn't want to imply with uh, this initiative that, you know, th that, you know, wallets should be all forced to, you know, behave the exact same way. Um, you know, as for example, my friends over at Zeus, and, you know, Evan and Bosch, they, they're, they're trying to build one of the best mobile wallets, best, you know, mobile wallet they can build for full node operators. I don't ever see a wallet like that, um, you know, wanting to, I mean, maybe they would, but I don't see, I don't know if they, if, if a wallet like that is going to want to simplify things too much, um, because, you know, I think that that user base is uh, probably going to be for a more advanced user. Um, you know, that's, that's, you know, I'm, that's their project. So it's not for me to decide, but I'm saying that, that that's an example where a wallet would, uh, might want to cater to a more advanced user, but you know, then you have uh, somebody trying to build something like, you know, Moon or Cash App or something like that, and they might want to provide that simplified experience. So I think that I think there's there's rooms for different kinds of products. But I mean, you know, one of the downsides, one of the kind of UX flows we we keep talking about is like, um, you know, what if uh, the you know, one downside could be that um, the wallet supports you know on chain and Lightning, but in this particular situation you know, due to whatever, you know, is going on liquidity on the network, it's actually uh, cheaper for the person to make an on-chain transaction. And so like, you know, you, you, you can see that downside as being, well, the wallet, you know, um, the, the user could have saved more money if they knew it, if they, if they had a choice, but they, they ended up spending a little bit more than they could have. And, um, you know, an, I mean, another situation, I guess you could argue that, you know, I think somebody pointed out earlier, I can't remember who, that like, what if it's a larger amount of money and uh, maybe that's more secure on chain? Um, and, uh, you know, aren't, aren't both of those instances where the wallet should decide on what to do and, and, and you can still present the same QR code with the lightning invoice in it? Yeah, I would say let the like, you know, if you, you know, you have to kind of think about the business logic of these wallets, if, um, you know, there's there should be like sensible defaults. But if there's a situation the user needs to know, like, uh, in my opinion, the UI should present that to the user in some way. So, like, you know, m maybe, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe the wallet, if, maybe if it is actually cheaper to send a, you know, on chain, maybe you come up with an error message that says, hey, with this particular payment, you can save money um, if you're okay waiting for an hour for the payment to go through, right? And so then like, if I, if I make an error message like that, I, I've just kind of come up with some copy there that doesn't actually say the word on-chain or lightning, but it expresses the decision in a way that tells the user like what the trade-offs are. You can save some money on fees, it's just gonna take a little bit longer. So I think that there's there's ways you could kind of build some kind of decision flows in there um, that could protect the user um, uh, and, and all of that without having to make them think about the difference between the two. Yeah. But uh, I'd be curious to hear that. That's my opinion. I'm a little biased. So I'd be curious to hear if other people have some drawbacks that they see. Hey, uh, Daniel here. Yeah, I was just going to say that n none of what you just talked about seems to be the fault of the QR code. It's all the all down to the wallet's, uh, you know, logic. So that seems like a solvable thing. But I was going to ask about the size of the QR code itself. Is is that something that is growing with this with this uh, proposal? And how aware are we of the implications of that on, you know, say lower spec phones and c cameras? Yeah, absolutely. That's going to be a problem. Real quick, I want to go ahead and say that I see we've got Millie, Michael, and someone whose name begins with A with their hands raised. So I'm going to make this quick so I can pass it over to them. But yes, the QR code size is definitely a problem. I've personally experienced on Android, you know, some some like older Android phones where you can't scan QR codes or um, sometimes you have a, an open source library that is unable to focus uh, on the QR code. So it's definitely problematic and uh, more work needs to be done. Um, so, uh, just the other day I pushed an update to the website that, uh, allows not just for wallet testing, but for hardware testing. So where we can document how different pieces of hardware, um, 
could solve that or how, how different pieces of hardware perform with the massively larger QR code. I think Bolt 12 offers, um, which will could replace invoices in the future, could significantly slim down the QR codes if we get widespread Bolt 12 adoption in the industry. Um, Animated QR codes could also be a solution, but that's kind of like another format you have to get people to adopt. So um, that's that's probably a, a major drawback that like I don't know the answer to. And um, the best I can say at the moment is that we should continue to do testing. And if anybody wants to test this QR code on your phone, um, there's a form you can go to on the website where you can submit like you know what experience you had with what particular phone. Let us know if it worked for you or if it didn't work. Um, but I want to get some of these raised hands. I see um, maybe uh, maybe we go Millie Michael, Millie Michael Alsazia. Sure. Um, I'm just going to maybe change the subject a little bit. Just going back to Brad uh, said regarding the terminology like Lightning versus um, Bitcoin. Why do people think that Lightning is another coin? Can, could you expand a little bit more on that? Yeah, and I, you know, I, this was just a small data set from people, and I, I think um, the specific data set was was those who are who have heard of Bitcoin, who maybe were new to Bitcoin, early adopters. So <clears throat> their knowledge is pretty small, and um, you know, for Cash App, it's super important. We've got a really broad, wide audience, and and so. You know, uh, like it's important to understand people's um, their understanding of of like the terminology. If we were to introduce something like that or talk about it, um, you know, I, I think there could that's a point of confusion that we we saw. So um, I don't know the exact reasons. I think you know. Uh, someone said like in passing they've they've heard of Litecoin or something so they uh, I think from their memory they related that to to Lightning and again this was just us gathering quick survey data so it was nothing specific on UI or anything like that oh that's really interesting yeah, the confusion with Light and Lightning thank you for that yeah, we've heard that. I mean, Brad was referring to some like user testing we've done. I know Steve Lee has told me he's heard it many times um, that people think because I, I think Litecoin was basically a fork of Bitcoin and its promise was like, you know, it's a lightweight, fast payment. Right. And its big advantage over Bitcoin was it was faster. So Lightning, Litecoin, uh, you know, we have I, I think our last earnings call, we had 44 million monthly active users on Cash App. So. Uh, we need to think in the tens of millions of people on um, what they think and what they see in the news that like Coinbase and other exchanges may be listing Litecoin and, and that confusion. So, yeah, the branding matters. And I think we're a team less is more when it comes to this. I'm just going to drop a bomb and say that Litecoin also has a Lightning network. So there is one more confusion. They basically support Lightning as well. So there you go. I saw a tether on Lightning uh, yesterday as well, right? And so, I mean, you can make an analogy that customers are okay with it because they're used to debit cards and ACH transfers and wire transfers, like in the legacy system. And we could replicate that. We could have three different options. But I personally think that's kind of gross, right? Like, why, why did people ever need to know ACH? Like, why do regular people say ACH as a clearinghouse term, right? Why, why do we have to expose people to wire and all these different tools that should just work, right? So, um, I think, Millie, did you have anything else? I think um, I was going to go next and then hand it over to Lisa. Or, Lisa, do you want to go ahead? I I've been talking. Go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, Alsazia, I'm not sure how to pronounce your screen name. Uh, would you like to speak? Yeah, <clears throat> well, to ask you a question. You said that um, there's a few wallets out there that uh, are not backwards compatible with uh, BIP21. Do you know which ones are they? Well, we'd have to go check uh, BitcoinQR.dev, which is the uh, website where we're tracking this. And here, let me go there right now and see. 
Uh, the problem with working in Bitcoin is that every time you want to go to a website, you type in B-I-T-C-O-I-N, hoping it'll auto-populate the website. And uh, you've got so many websites that begin with the word Bitcoin that it just takes forever to auto-populate. Okay, um, if we go down to this list here, I mean, some of the ones out of the ones we've tested, um, you know, Bitcoin Beach Wallet, um, I've opened a, an issue with uh, in their repository and they um, seem receptive to the idea. Uh, I, I believe uh, Cash App, um, Chivo Wallet, um, and... Uh, those, oh, and uh, Strike, and uh, Zebedee, and Zeus. Uh, but several of these uh, have issues open on GitHub. Um, and, and and just to reframe it, like in terms of like backwards compatibility, it's kind of an interesting thing because a lot of these wallets, like it, the case with many of these wallets is, um, not, not all the ones, but many of the wallets I just mentioned, they're actually uh, can read a BIP21 QR code. The problem is, is that they're not used to looking for a lightning invoice inside of it. So they'll read the QR code, but they'll, um, they'll just default to using the on-chain address. Um, and uh, so what we're, we're trying to talk to these projects about is the idea of like, yes, please continue reading the QR code, but before you default to on-chain, check and see if there's a lightning you know, parameter in there. But I mean, that's fine. I mean, they, as long as you're backwards compatible, you as a wallet can start to um, deploy this feature. And uh, if some other payer can read correctly and send to Lightning, then fine, better. If it doesn't, it just gets back to the other alternative, which is an on-chain transaction. You can start to deploy that in production. Yeah, you're, I mean, I, I think you're kind of right there. We like, we need, there needs to be, I think, a little bit more support among wallets because like an example of where there could be friction is like, um, you know, let's say one person has the Zebedee wallet and they're like a lightning only wallet. And then the other person is um, using, uh, you know, some kind of wallet that supports both uh, on-chain and lightning, like Moon. And so let's say, you know, Moon tomorrow is just like, yeah, we're doing it. We're just making a single unified QR code and uh, they do it. And then, then suddenly uh, they can't receive any Bitcoin from somebody who has a lightning only wallet like Zebedee um, or like, you know, uh, I, think, I can't remember if Breeze supports it or not, but just any of those lightning, other, of those lightning only wallets, you, you would, you would sever the connection there if uh, between a dual lightning on chain wallet and a lightning wallet. So, I think, think part of this is like um, it, it's more critical, actually, I think, to get these lightning only wallets to support um, uh, reading it. Um, if, if, if Bitcoin Beach, you know, it does both of them. So if Bitcoin Beach defaults to using on chain. It's like eh, it's higher fees for the user, but it's not the end of the world. But if a lightning only wallet can't scan the Bit 21 QR code, that's the situation where basically the payment can't happen and. Um, you know, the user is sad and all of that. Okay, so it is mostly a problem for Lightning wallets. But how many, do we have any sense or stats as to how many users actually send transactions via scanning QR codes rather than um, using a URI by pissing it in? It's a somewhat separate question, really, not uh, too much related to the previous one. I, I don't personally know of any um, stats uh, about that. My, my intuition would be that I think more people use the QR code, um, just at least at least in a place like El Salvador, where you know, you're, you're going to be presented with a QR code um, either on somebody's phone or when you're transacting with them or via the point of sale system. But you know, if, if people are transacting, um, you know, online and they're using tools like BTC Pay and other platforms and maybe they're just clicking links. I wouldn't really have a way of knowing, but that's actually been a huge uh, topic in the community lately about um, uh, research and just how we, we don't kind of have enough enough data um, about this stuff. I see that uh, Christoph uh, has his, his hand raised. Oh, hey, I wanted to go, go back to something that I've heard a few times before, which was the the TCP IP idea uh, that the, this Bitcoin Lightning is kind of similar. And, and I reject that a bit because 
in Bitcoin Lightning, there are fees involved uh, that can be very different and, and speeds also. Um, and I think we have to be very sensitive kind of kind of the, the practical realities. So if, look, looking at Moon, for example, uh, they present a unified um, balance. So you only see one balance, but you can receive both Bitcoin and Lightning. And as a user, you don't have to worry about it. But you kind of have to, um, because what happens behind the scenes, and th they do this um, to give you full control over your Bitcoin, is it's actually always Bitcoin. You never have funds on Lightning. If you receive something on Lightning, they will convert it for you via a submarine swap uh, to on-chain, which is great because if Moon goes away, if the app goes away, you can have very, very nicely uh, created um, recovery tools and a, and a PDF that guides you through everything. So there's a, there's a great benefit of doing it that way. However, um, because they do these submarine swaps behind the scenes, they don't tell you about it. Uh, you might uh, incur fees for opening channels or for those swaps. Now they're pretty optimized, but there can be situations where, and I think somebody told me that um, they wanted to send somebody, they wanted to pay somebody for a cab and they sent them $12, I think, and only $8 arrived in their wallet because there were $4 of fees uh, um, were incurred because of the what had happened behind the scenes. So I think we have to be sensitive to those those realities too. I mean, it's sometimes nice to say, yeah, it should be all the same, but it just kind of gets complicated. And there are also differences. So if you're if you're let's say Cash App and you have kind of a, a hosted or custodial setup, is very different than you know if you're trying to to create the most open source self custodial uh, decentralized application uh, where the user is always in full control and never relies on, on any third party service or if you're in some between or what your philosophy is about uh, the relationship between the user and the, and the product. Hey, so this has uh, turned into like a really, uh, I guess, fascinating uh, topic because uh, we've ended up spending a, a a long time on this topic. Um, so I'm glad everybody's engaged. Did we want to go over um, any of the Bolt Fun stuff before um, we have to part ways? Yeah, I'm seeing like heart and hand wavy emojis and stuff. So, I mean, uh, yeah, for anyone who's not aware, um, uh, John's and uh, Ed, um, other members of the design community, they've um, put together this uh, Bolt Fund project, which is kind of a it's kind of a sub community of Bitcoin design for uh, builders and makers. So they're trying to get designers and developers uh, collaborating on uh, building, you know, cool stuff. So they got a hackathon running this week, and uh, I believe uh, the submissions are due next Monday, I believe. Um, so, but. You got to check out their website, Bolt.Fun, and they've got um, a lot of good speakers from the Lightning community uh, doing workshops on how to build toolkits and uh, stuff like that. So, um, I, you know, I think uh, you, you can start hacking right away if you want, or, uh, you know, you can do the workshops and start hacking on Friday. It's, it's, it's kind of up to you, but I know we've got several people, uh, new members of the community who are uh, participating in the hackathon. Um, Millie uh, is participating. I know. I know she's got a team. Uh, I think she's... Um, uh, I would ask her about her uh, experience thus far on it, but I think she's uh, uh, went off of the stage. Um, but if anybody else wants to share their experiences or thoughts on the hackathon, now's the time. Join my workshop on the Bitcoin design guide and the Bitcoin UI kit tomorrow, please. Otherwise I'll be lonely. Ah. I want to say something. I want to say thank you to Stefan, Christophe, Daniel, uh, Patricia, all the people who start in the beginning, the Bitcoin design community, Pablo Nex. Uh, I think it's beautiful the work you, we are doing as a community now uh, because if you want to start in Bitcoin, sometimes Bitcoin core is too complicated and too hard. And I am so happy to be part of the community because it's a, uh, nice welcoming community and a beautiful starting point for everyone as a designer as a product manager as a uh, as a developer like we can collaborate and just keep rocking guys like i'm so happy to be part of this community and thank you for all the work you already did in the last year thank you so much guys
No, oh, thank you very much. I'm glad you're uh, glad you're enjoying it here. Hey, I see. I uh, see. Millie uh, made it back on uh, back on stage. How's uh, how's your experience been so far with uh, Bolt Fun? Oh, hi guys. Sorry, I just had to go to the gym. Um, it's been great, honestly. Like um, with the talks um, that um, the the speakers were giving, they were super interesting. I learned a lot about uh, Albi, which I, I didn't know that they were doing this, which I found it was super cool. And also, I don't know if there's other people who are in this call that are participating to Hackathon, but I will really suggest um, to go on these uh, uh, lightning sprints because basically you can talk about your project and John and Ed will be there to help you uh, sort of figure out uh, how you can do your project. And there's a uh, Bumi as well uh, there. So for example, I just talked about uh, what, what I, think we're going to design for our project with John and he really helped me to go through that user flow and understanding um, how I could uh, present this. So yeah, I really encourage uh, everyone to, to go on these design sprints. Yeah, John's design sprints are uh, pretty, pretty epic. Like uh, for anyone who's never been on one of them, he, uh, you know, takes you into Figma and has all these, you know, kind of virtual sticky notes laid out. And he kind of, you know, asks you questions to try and like draw ideas out of you and all of that kind of stuff. And then, you know, at the end of the sprint, you've, uh, you know, basically got this kind of, you know, idea for a product and, uh, you know, a problem, a, a problem that you're trying to solve for a very specific person and the, the kind of steps that the person is going to take to get through to get through that journey. So yeah, real cool. Highly recommend uh, you check out what he's working on over there. We are getting uh, pretty uh, pretty close to the uh, hour here. Um, does anybody uh, have uh, any uh, final thoughts, uh, whether it be about the hackathon or feedback on the guide or uh, um, other things uh, going on that you uh, want to mention before we go? Hey, Stephen, I just want to say I uh, really appreciate uh, this community existing and every, all the work that you and everybody else is doing. Um, also, just to give a little bit of backstory, uh, I heard about BIP21 from a developer in El Salvador at one of the Lightning conferences. And then I came back and I told Steve Lee and Miles and Brad, and we've been jamming on it. And you know, we just loved it, the beauty that it's an open standard, right? And I love the beauty that I learned from it from the community. And and, and Brad and I and the rest of the Cash App team uh, want to be more involved in this community. And, you know, we are a custodial app and we're a large publicly traded company. So we may not be able to spill all of our future roadmaps, but um, we definitely want to be heavily involved and develop more in public with the community. So I uh, just wanted to say, um, you know, we, we've been testing various devices. I'm literally getting like 20 old phones next week and we're going to be scanning a bunch of um, QR codes. Uh, and testing. So we will definitely fill out that form and kind of share our experiences and really appreciate you all putting together that website and uh, just want to sign us up for doing as much as we can to help. So I'll probably follow up with you and or others on how we contribute. And um, yeah, love being a part of these. So I think you'll be seeing more of uh, the Brad and I's in these kind of spaces. So thank you all. Yeah, I was literally going to say thank you uh, for joining today. I thought it was a really interesting and meaty and productive discussion. And it's, it's great to have, you know, um, people from um, products, Bitcoin products with uh, a lot of users involved. And it's, it's, um, it really makes uh, it feel like we're making progress when, when this is happening. So thanks, everybody, to uh, chimed in today in the, in the call. Hey, Pablo, next, you had your hand raised a second ago. Yeah, just wanted quickly to mention that next week we'll be having a Bitcoin design sprint call 
uh, on Blix wallet onboarding, trying to you know come up with a final solution after four sprints, I believe. And also next week, I'm also scheduling straight on version two um, call for people who are new designers, maybe to Bitcoin and just want to help us with getting uh, nice visuals, logos and uh, branding for this awesome open source uh, Bitcoin mining protocol. So as always, I'm just shilling things and that's about it. Thank you all. This was a very awesome and productive uh, discussion. I enjoyed it. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. This is uh, this has been really, uh, really great. Uh, thanks for all the kind words and uh, thanks for showing up and uh, contributing ideas. Um, and I guess uh, just uh, check out the uh, make sure you're following the calendar uh, file on GitHub. So you see when our next call is on your calendar it should be about about three weeks from now. Um, so, yeah, uh, have a good day, everybody. Catch you later.